I'm very pleased to be joined by Stephen Hindy, the chairman and president of the Brooklyn Brewery, which he co-founded in 1987, and Anthony DiDio, a 25-year veteran of the food and wine business, now with the wine importer and distributor Lauber Imports. Gentlemen, welcome to Citywide. Thank you. Great to be here. So, is New York a beer and alcohol town? New York is a, a big uh, alcoholic beverage town. I mean, the beer business alone, I think, is at wholesale between th three and four billion dollars. And if you add in wine, it's got to be another billion or, exactly. or two. Uh, it, it's people like to drink in this town. I'm happy to say. <laughs> I, I judge it by empty bottles on Monday during the recycling, and just kind of walk up and down my street and see uh, some some great wine bottles that people have shared. So. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and that means a lot of employment for, for people also. Steve, tell us a little bit about the, the Brooklyn Brewery, uh, uh, how you got started with it, and what it's like to, to build a, a business like that in New York. Well, the Brooklyn Brewery is the first successful uh, brewery in New York City in uh, more than, in about 30 years. Uh, you know, there was a great heyday of brewing in New York. A hundred years ago, there were 48 breweries in Brooklyn alone. The last two big Brooklyn breweries, uh, Schaefer and Rheingold, had closed in 76. So when our company came along, it was really uh, the first brewery to put down roots in the city uh, in, in a couple of decades. Uh, it's been uh, a great adventure uh, starting a business in New York City, and I think any business is a, is a great adventure, but uh, particularly so with, with, with the beer business, uh, because um, surprisingly, I think customers in New York took to our company from the very beginning because there are a lot of independent business people uh, in the hospitality business in New York City. It's not all chain restaurants that uh, have national uh, buyers and that uh, sort of thing. It's people who can identify with someone starting up uh, and peddling his beer door to door. So uh, there were plenty of adventures, plenty of hurdles, plenty of mistakes along the way, but uh, right now we're the number 32 brewery in the United States among all breweries, about 400 breweries uh, in the U.S. and, and 1,000 brewery restaurants, and we're the number five draft beer in New York City. So we've come a long way in, in 18 years. How many people do you employ? Today we have about 35 uh, people. Uh, at, at the high point we had 100 people when we were distributing our own beer. Um, we're looking to expand in New York. We're hoping to be able to move down to the waterfront uh, sometime in the next few years and build a bigger, bigger brewery. And uh, if we do that, we would probably be back up over 100 people employed. Tony, most of your customers are restaurants as mm -hmm. opposed to individual consumers. You, you educate a lot of people about wine, but you, you, you sell to, to restaurants. Right, we sell, we sell to anyone that has a license from New York State. Let's say, let's just talk New York City. Uh, we have restaurants, private clubs, hotels, uh, bars, and then the package stores, or, you know, liquor stores. So there, there, there's like, almost like five tiers of, 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 uh, of customers. And we have something like 2,000 customers in New York City alone. Now, uh, Lauber not only distributes in New York City, but the whole state of New York, the whole state of Jersey, and Pennsylvania, which was a challenge, but it's going very well right now. What are some of the brands that that uh, our viewers might recognize that you that you sell? We have some we have some uh, some big name brands like uh, Raymond Raymond Vineyards uh, coming out of Napa Valley. That's a that's a very very big brand. Uh, we have uh, brands coming out of uh, Chile and Argentina. Los Vascos is one of the biggest uh, growing brands. Uh, in America right now. Uh, Jordan uh, Vineyards out of Sonoma. Uh, there's, there's so many. We have 105 brands from California alone. Then we uh, distribute from Washington State and then uh, Oregon and also New York State. We go out to uh, Long Island and we, we, we uh, represent out there Bedell and uh, Cory Creek. My, my sense of the restaurant business in New York is that <clears throat> the quality has gone up. As I think back 25 years ago, um, that uh, sort of you had the sort of some of the fancy French restaurants, you had uh, high-end steakhouses, and then um, it was when restaurant associates started introducing sort of concept restaurants uh, uh, that 
sort of a new ethos evolved. But today, it seems like new restaurants are opening up every day, but they're also, on the very first day that they open, they're a much higher quality than the, than the same establishment would have been oh, yeah. uh, 25 years ago. Yeah. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Oh, oh definitely. I was, I, was, uh, I was just at, it's funny, I picked up the New York Times today, and, uh, and in the uh, dining in section, there's a, there's a, uh, Florence Fabricant writes a, a great article about restaurants and, and chefs on the move, chefs on the go. And the oh. uh, first, first uh, topic she talked about was a, a restaurant called Varietal that is opening today that I was at the opening last week. Uh, last, I think, Thursday night I went to it. And they had what's known as friends and family, where they invite their friends and family, and and really they try out the dishes on you, and uh, try out the service, and they ask you to fill out a little form afterwards and see how they did. And but the point is that every day in New York there are more and more restaurants opening, people taking the plunge, and the quality is there. You cannot slipshod, you cannot be, you cannot cheap out in terms of decor, or quality of food, or wine, or beer. People do not want to go in there and do it. So the demand for those restaurants is because I think consumers have become more more sophisticated. Are they more demanding uh, now than they were when you started the brewery? Well, I think the the, the flowering of restaurants uh, in New York over the last 20 years has, has really raised the bar, as, oh, as Tony definitely. was saying. Uh, you've got to be on your game from, from day one uh, to make it here. And it's astounding, even in the outer boroughs, uh, the number of restaurants that have, uh, that have opened in the last 20 years. You know, places like Williamsburg, where, where our brewery is located, when we started in business, we had one customer in that whole neighborhood. <laughs> now there must be 300. I mean, bars and, right, and great right, restaurants. Right, right. Um, and the same is true of Smith Street over in, uh, you know, in uh, near Brooklyn Heights. Uh, we had one account on that street when we started in business, and now there must be 200 on Fifth Avenue yeah. and Park Slope. Uh, it's just astounding what's happening. And, and they Fourth are Fourth Avenue in Brooklyn. And now Fourth, Fourth, Fourth Avenue in Brooklyn, Avenue in Brooklyn <laughs> if you can believe that. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it, it's quite amazing. And, and they are very demanding. Uh, New York, you know, a lot of people thought Brooklyn Brewery succeeded because we put the name Brooklyn on yeah, the bottom. Let's talk about that a little yeah. bit. Well, it's funny. In the beginning, when we decided to name the beer Brooklyn, there were people, including uh, some of our investors, who said, are you sure you want to call it Brooklyn? And I said, yeah. I, you know, I think right. Brooklyn's one of these mythical places in America. I think it's, it means something here. It means something around the world. I think it's a great name. But a lot of people were skeptical. Uh, but uh, today, uh, you know, I look like uh, I'm a marketing genius for well, having named it. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go a little further than that, Steve, because I think that at, you know, 20, 25 years ago, when people uh, said the word Brooklyn, it was kind of a, the nostalgia market. It was all the people yeah. who had moved out of Brooklyn but right. kind of remembered the Dodgers uh, kind of thing. And, and she's and, and And I I would go so far as to suggest, and I'm not kissing up to you, although I'd be perfectly happy to do that if you like, that <laughs> um, that the, 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 the brand that you developed helped give Brooklyn the new hipster feel that has made it so exciting and, and attractive today. The fact that you... Um, opened up the brewery in, in Williamsburg, and, and young people could come and start to, to mm -hmm. experience that. It, it sort of set a tone for what people think of around the world as, as Brooklyn today. You know, it's true. It's, it, it's, it's true about that because if you, you think about the uh, about the beer, if you're thinking about the beer and wine uh, market in, in New York, uh, I I'm one of those people, and obviously I've been in the business 25 years. And uh, the minute I walk into a, a restaurant or a bar. I'm looking to see what's you know what 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 bottles are behind the bar and what's on tap because uh -huh. I always enjoy tap beer more than bottled beer. Right. No offense, but it's you know I rather I rather have that tap. So I'm looking at that. But Brooklyn beer, uh, I run a party every two years at my house, and I have I have winemakers from all over the world. We we import from 16 countries, and uh, and every two years there's a there's a there's a show in New York, and that they come to big wine tasting. And they, everybody ends up at my house on a Saturday, and I only serve Brooklyn beer. I only serve his beer. He doesn't know that, but I only serve Brooklyn beer because I'm proud of it, and people identify with it, and they, they, they think it's so cool that they're in Brooklyn uh, drinking Brooklyn beer. And I think that the, the, the cinema and the film industry has been so 
bad to, towards Brooklyn over. Yeah. If you think of over the last 30 years, uh, I mean, the image of Brooklyn has really been 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 tarnished because of because of the film industry. I said it takes guys like Steve to bring it back, and I'm thinking of opening a wine, you know winery, Brooklyn winery. Why right. not? Well, Tony, you, you used to make wine, right? The I still do. Yeah, I right. still do. I make. I. I. I uh, my grandfather made wine uh, in our basement. My dad helped him. I helped him. And in 1986, 87, when I moved into my uh, current house in Carroll Gardens, I found the old crush and and press in, huh. in in the basement. And within two weeks, we started making wine. Well, you, you know, fun. that's how I got in the beer business as well. Uh, I. I I, th this is a little bit of a stretch, but I, I used to be a foreign correspondent uh, in the Middle East for Associated Press for six years. While I was there, I covered a lot of great stories, a lot of exciting stories. Uh, but uh, uh, I worked a little bit in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, where they have Islamic law, you can't buy alcoholic beverages. All the foreigners make their own beer at home. So I got into making my own beer, oh, and then funny. when That's I came back story. to New York, uh, <laughs> I was brewing beer at home in, in Brooklyn, and uh, eventually that uh, led my neighbor, Tom Potter, and I to start the Brooklyn Brewery. So the roots of the Brooklyn Brewery are really uh, in the Middle East, which is, <laughs> which is where the roots of beer are uh, And wine as well. And wine as well. Yeah. 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 So. Citywide will continue right after this. There is really only one boy. One girl. One tree. One forest. One deep dancing ocean. One mountain calling. One handful of sand through our fingers. One endless sky overhead, and one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking about the liquor industry with Anthony DiDio, director of key accounts for Lauber Imports, and Stephen Hindi, the chairman and president of the Brooklyn Brewery. Both of you uh, do a fair amount of um, speaking and writing and educating uh, people about um, uh, your, the products that you sell as well as about uh, your business. Tony, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, why you do that and uh, what kind of value it brings to consumers? Well, uh, I do primarily, I do, it's, it's actually on two levels. I do wine tastings uh, for the public uh, and I started them in 1985 at Eastern Athletic Club, our old, uh, sure. our old health club that I still belong to. And I started that uh, really because I just loved wine so much. And in the year 84, 85, we would have 30, 40 people come to a free tasting. And it was great. It was actually the beginning, the beginning almost the genesis of, of, of interest in wine. Now I'm also not, still doing that on a smaller scale, but at least three times a year doing that for the public, but then I also educate in restaurants. I go to uh, restaurants and do what's known as staff training, where we sit down with the, uh, just did one at Porter House in Time Warner Building, uh, just did one at uh, Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, and sit down with the sommelier, sit down with the wait staff, and talk about four or five of the wines that we distribute that are on the list, and, and just talk about some of the fine points. But the most important thing is that I sit down and let them taste the wine and, and have a dialogue with them. So we love that. You have captured some of that experience in a book, The, the Renaissance uh, Guide to uh, Wine and Food Pairing, uh, that's available uh, online and in, in bookstores. Tell us what, a, what I'll find uh, if I open up this book. Uh, a lot of pictures of me. No, uh, what you're gonna find in there is, is not my opinion or the opinion of my co-author, Amy Zavato. What you're going to find also is the opinions of, uh, of great chefs and great winemakers. We were able to sit down with six of the top chefs in New York. Uh, Danielle Balud of Restaurant Danielle uh, wrote the forward to the book, and he, put, he 
sent me a menu of about seven courses, eight courses. Amy and I sat down and we said, okay, maybe these wines will work, this wines won't work, let's bring them. Rick Moonen did the same thing, the former owner of Oceana, uh, Don Pintavona, you know, chefs of that level, Michael LaMonaco, and each of them submitted a menu to me, and, and Amy and I went with uh, wine in tow to the restaurant. We sat down, we had a full meal with them, and just tried out the wine. So it was, it was a dialogue between Amy and I and the chefs, and saying, hey, this will work, that doesn't work, maybe we should try this, try that, and, and that's, what you, that's what you're getting from that book. And then you're also getting a uh, opinion from four of the top winemakers, uh, Paul Draper from Ridge, Jim Clendenin uh, from Aubin Clement. Uh, we sat down with them and talked to them about their experiences about not only making wine, but are you making wine that, that you're thinking about food at the same time? Uh, what do you do? My, my, my greatest uh, question for Paul Draper was, who is an idol to me, and uh, I said, Paul, I said, so when you walk into a restaurant, are you thinking about food or are you thinking about wine? <laughs> What's coming first? He goes, well, he goes, sometimes I'm in the mood for a Bordeaux, so then I'll start looking at the menu in a different way. Sometimes I'm in the mood for food, then I'll go with the wine. So it's just interesting. So it's not, it's not a book about opinions. As humble as I can be, I don't think my opinion amounts for much, but the opinions of the people that make the food and make the wine, I think it does count. Steve, not surprising given your background as a journalist, you also have uh, uh, published a book, uh, uh, Beer School, uh, together with uh, with your partner uh, Tom Potter. It's coming out soon in paperback. It's It's been out uh, for about a year. Um, but it's not so much about uh, what kind of beer people should drink, it's about how you build a, a beer business. Uh, tell us uh, about your book. Well, it's... Uh it, the book is actually doing very well in, in business schools uh, across the country because, uh, you know, I really put my journalist hat on in writing that book. And I w Tom and I were very honest about things we did right and things we screwed up. And I think most entrepreneurs who write stories about their success uh, tend to cast themselves as uh, geniuses. Well, we, we were very humble and very honest about our, our experience in starting a business and um, I wrote about half the chapters, Tom wrote half. Uh, each chapter is an episode, a passage in the building of the business and then if I wrote the chapter, Tom weighs in with his point of view on that particular Maybe episode. he doesn't remember it quite the same way. That's exactly <laughs> right. You get two different uh, perspectives and you know I was a journalist, Tom was a banker so we look at things in, in different ways and then he grades us on that particular uh, passage. Um, and the same thing with chapters he wrote, I grade him. I think we end up with a cum of like 3.1, which is actually better than I did in college. You know? <laughs> so so uh, uh, there's progress. Putting aside the, the use of the word Brooklyn for a second, what's the one thing that you, that you think was the, like the smartest thing you did, and, 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 and what's the, the one thing that you, you would really do over uh, differently if you could? <laughs> Well, uh, it's very simple, distribution. We distributed our own beer, uh, which is very unusual for a, a startup brewery. Um, we did that on the advice of one of our Brooklyn neighbors, a, an entrepreneur named Sophia Collier. She lived on our block. She started Soho Natural Soda. I don't know if you remember sure, that. Remember right, yeah, sure, yeah. And yeah. when we were starting up uh, in, in the late 80s, she was selling her company to Seagram's. Uh, for twenty million dollars. So we were very impressed by our neighbor, uh, Sophia. And she advised us to distribute our own beer. She said, put your beer in a truck, put your logo on the truck, and go out there and pedal it. You're going to learn the business from the ground up that way. And that turned out to be very wise advice. That was not, not in our original business plan, but I don't think I'd be sitting here talking about the success of the Brooklyn Brewery had we not done that. And the biggest mistake? The biggest mistake is pretty easy to put your finger on. Uh, you know, we, we launched a dot-com um, idea called TotalBeer.com in the late 90s during the dot-com uh, craze. And we were delivering our beer and other beers that we distributed directly to people's homes. Uh, sort of what Fresh Direct is doing today, except they're doing all groceries and, and gourmet foods and beer and wine. Uh, we tried it with beer alone, and it was a disaster. We, I, we <laughs> lost more than a million dollars of, of our hard-earned money. I would suggest that one of the other smart things that you did was um, hiring a really top-notch designer, Milton Glaser, to come up with yeah. the, the look of the, of the label and the, uh, the logo 
uh, and brand. And I think that that's increasingly important in differentiating consumer uh, consumer products. Uh, Tony, I've seen articles in the newspaper recently that suggest that, that many um, less educated wine consumers, even mm -hmm. though they're spending a lot of money on wine, are picking their wines just based on the label, knowing nothing else about well, it. Well, you know, it, it's funny you should say that, and this is, this is, it, 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 this is, and I, and I know you, you probably know this study, that it's, there has been several studies saying that, and this is not a sexist uh, remark at all, that women tend to pick uh, wines by the labels. Uh, men, more so by the price and the reviews. Hmm. And trying to, to maybe get a common ground because uh, when I, when it, cause sometimes I go to wineries all over the world and I look at the label, I say, you know, guys, you got to, you know, do something with this label. No one's going, no one's going to buy it, and you can't charge sixty bucks for it either. Uh, people are becoming more and more educated about wine and about food and about beer and about microbrew beers. So you can't really fool them anymore once they taste it. You know, you can make yeah, them yeah. fool them once with a good package, but after that, or or a catchy phrase. The, uh, the, the label is important, the image is important, but you've, you've really got to have a, a product in the, in the bottle that people want to drink. Uh, and, and, you know, talking about the new restaurants in the city, they're very, very demanding on, on quality. And they don't care if it's called Brooklyn, they don't care what it's called, it's got to be the best. Let's talk a little bit about responsibility also, responsible drinking. Mm -hmm. um, I was struck when you mentioned that you got started with your wine tasting in a health club. Um, <laughs> obviously, it's a safe product, it's a legal product, but if it's, if it's abused, it's a problem, particularly by young people. How does, in your particular niches in the industry, how do you deal with those issues? Well, you know, m the beer we sell is priced fairly high. So we don't really find that uh, young people are drawn to this product. And, and I think that, likewise, the wines that Tony is selling are, are fairly high priced. I mean, it's not the kind that kids are going to sneak a bottle out uh, into the right. park at night. Um, and I also, we tend to promote our beer uh, in, in a, in, to a very different kind of consumer than, than the youth market. We're, we're not aimed at that at all. We've taken a page, actually, beer school uh, started with wine school. Uh, we, we have trained our salespeople in wine programs, and we sell our beer much more the way Tony sells wine uh, than the big guys with the mass advertising who do have the potential of appealing mm. to kids. Yeah, we, don't, we, we really don't have uh, the, the type of wines that we distribute, as many wines as we do distribute. Uh, very few of them have the kind of budget to do advertising. So it really is up to the 21 uh, great salespeople that we have here in New York City, plus the three sales managers. Uh, it, it's 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 really a foot soldier. Uh, mm -hmm. Hand sell. Trade. Yeah, it's definitely it's a hand sell. A lot of them. But in terms of in terms of the uh, the the problem with consumption or overconsumption, it, it really doesn't come up that much with uh, with I think. Uh, wines of our nature, the high ends, yeah, yeah. People are not like chugging Mouton, you know, you know, Chateau Mouton, uh, or, or Lafitte Rothschild, and just going out and driving their dad's Mercedes into the into the ground. It's it just it's just not happening. Well, you know, it, it, holidays coming up. Uh, give a great bottle of wine or a, a six pack of uh, Brooklyn beer, uh, or otherwise the Renaissance Guide to Wine and uh, Food Pairing. Uh, or beer school. My thanks to the authors, Steve Hindy, the chairman and president of the Brooklyn Brewery, uh, which he co-founded in 1987, and Anthony DiDio, 25-year veteran of the food and wine business, now with the wine importer and distributor Lauber Imports. I'm Ken Fisher. Thanks for joining us.